Okay, I think the power is not on. It's a Okay. All right. Start. Okay, we'll we'll do it in the break time. No, no issues, right? Okay, let's pray and we'll start. Thank you. Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for a new day in our lives. And Father, we ask that. As we spend time in your word, spend time learning, we welcome the ministry of the Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts, to enlighten our minds, to open our eyes and ears and our hearts. May we understand, may we receive, and may we be equipped to live for you and to glorify your name. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So, um, since we had a long break, uh, we will uh, have to do a little review. Uh, let's go, please, to uh, lesson number 34, uh, section 4, lesson 34, which is page 48. And we will start from there. Just quickly review uh, some things, and then we will get started. So, in this course, we are talking about our identity in Christ, right? Who we are in Christ, about the life that we have in Jesus. And it's important for us to understand our identity in Christ, who we are in Christ, what God has given to us in Christ, and live out of that, right? And uh, that is the way we are supposed to live out of our life in Christ. So Jesus is the wine. We are branches on the wine. His life is flowing in us. And we live out of that. Right? And that's what is going to enable us to live like Jesus. Right? It's going to enable us to walk as he walked, uh, to live as he lived, and to reveal Jesus to this world. Right? We can't do it in our own strength, but we can do it with the life that we have in Christ, right? So we're learning about that. Uh, for some of us, it may be new, uh, but we need to uh, open our hearts and minds and receive this and begin to live out of these truths. So uh, section four, lesson number 34. Uh, in this lesson, we, we started talking about the fact that we are sanctified in Christ. That means in Christ, God has already sanctified us. That means he set us apart. To sanctify means to be set apart for God. God has already sanctified you. He sanctified me. He's set us apart for himself. He's made us holy unto him. Right? So let's all say this together. I am sanctified in Christ. God has made me holy for himself in Christ, right? So as far as God is concerned, he's already done this for you. He said, I made you holy, I set you apart. But now in our life on earth, the way living here, we face all kinds of challenges, all kinds of temptations, all kinds of sin around us. And so what do we have to do? We have to say, I am sanctified, I'm holy. And I live out of that as a holy person because God has already made me holy in Christ. He's already made us holy in Christ. So we live out of that. And then our life on earth also becomes holy. right? Our life on earth becomes holy because he has made us holy in Christ. Are you understanding? Many times... We, we are taught the opposite. We are taught that you have to be holy, then you will become holy. Then you say, no, it's the other way. God has made me holy, so therefore I will be holy. Right? He, I've already become holy in Christ. In Christ I have been sanctified. Therefore, I'm going to live holy. I'm going to live out of that identity 
and I'm going to live out of that life that I have in Jesus. Are you understanding? Right? So we also have to change the way we think and begin to think according to what God has done for us in Christ, as the scriptures revealed to us. So let me go ahead and share the, uh, the notes, and then we will uh, quickly review uh, some of the things we've seen and move forward. All right. So Christ is our sanctification. That means in Christ, we are sanctified. First Corinthians, page, page 48, bottom of page 48, First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. But of him, or because of him, you are in Christ Jesus. So underline that, in Christ Jesus. I am in Christ. Who became for us wisdom from God. So Jesus has become my wisdom. Jesus has become your wisdom. He's become wisdom for you from God. Right? We will talk about that later. And righteousness. So Jesus is your righteousness. And the sanctification, that's what we are focusing on, right? So each one of these words, we can, we can study. Christ is our wisdom. Christ is our righteousness. Christ is our sanctification. Christ is our redemption. So let's say this together. Christ is my wisdom. Christ is my righteousness. Christ is my sanctification. And Jesus is my redemption. Amen? So that means in him I have this. In him I have wisdom. In him you and I have righteousness. In him you and I have sanctification. In him you and I have redemption. We are focusing on sanctification. That means in Christ you are sanctified. You have been made holy in Jesus. God has made you holy. Right? Uh, Ephesians 1 4. Just as he chose us in him. Again, you underline in him. This is about being in Christ. He chose us in him. Before the foundation of the world. That means this was God's plan even before he created anything. What was his plan? That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. We should be holy and without blame before him. So you are holy before God. No. God has made you holy in his own eyes in Jesus Christ. So from that, we live holy. So, uh, lesson 35, uh, we emphasize this, that... We are currently, right now, we are sanctified in Christ. When Paul is writing to the Corinthian church, you see the Corinthian church was not a perfect church. They had lots of problems. They were fighting amongst themselves. Who is greater than the other? All kinds of problems. And Paul knew about it. But, when he's writing his letter, opening, salutation, greeting, how does he call them? He does not say, oh, you terrible sinners at Corinth. You're giving me a lot of headache. No, he doesn't say it like that. He doesn't address them that way. How does he address them? Look at it. First Corinthians 1 verse 2. To the church of God, which is at? Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ. So he says, you people, you are actually holy in Christ. Sanctified means holy. To those who are holy in Christ. Called to be saints. Not called to be sinners. Called to be saints. See how he's addressing them. Why is he addressing them like this? Because, see, in reality he knows they actually have lots of problems. Which he's going to address. The full letter he's going to address one after the other. All the problems in the church. He's going to, he knows they all have problems. But when he is looking at them, he's looking at them as they are in Christ. 
He's not looking at them just by their normal behavior. Their normal behavior had lots of problems they had to correct. But he's looking at them as how they are in Christ. So in Christ he's saying to the church of God which is at Corinth, you are sanctified in Christ. You are called to be saints. And you are holy in Christ, you are called to be his holy people. With all who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both there and I. That means this is true for everyone else in every place, including Bangalore, including Chennai and wherever. <laughs> the all, we all call upon the name of This is true. So for all believers, this is true. That we are sanctified in Christ and we are called to be saved. So that is our position in Christ. That is our life in Christ. Now, if we live from that life, then we will live like sanctified people. We will live like holy people. But if you don't live from that identity, then we will continue to be just doing, we will think we are sinful people, just keep doing all the wrong things. We will live according to our old life. But we are supposed to live according to the life that we have in us. Right? So that's what this uh, we are learning as we go through these scriptures. In that same epistle, he ag again states the same thing in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11. He says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, nor fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, now thieves, now covetous, and drunkards, or revilers, or extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. I mean, these kinds of people will not go into God's kingdom. Verse 11, he says, such were some of you. That means, look, some of, uh, some of us came from these kinds of backgrounds. We did all these bad things. But, verse 11, you were washed, you were sanctified, but you were justified. In the name of our Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our so that was your past life. You were like that. But now in Jesus, you are washed. All that dirt, that filth is gone. And you are sanctified. That means you are made holy. God has set you apart for himself. You are sanctified. And you are justified. Justified means to be made righteous. That means there is no sin on you. So this is what God has done for us in Christ. Right? So you embrace it. Let's say this together. I have been washed. I have been sanctified. I have been justified in Jesus Christ. Right? So if you're washed, don't think of yourself as a dirty person. Suppose, imagine, we didn't have bath for five days. <laughs> You'll feel so bad about yourself. First of all, you won't feel comfortable. Then you don't want to sit next to anybody because you're smelling bad. <laughs> so our whole behavior, everything is affected because we know we haven't washed. But if you have a nice bath, clean, smelling nice, then you're very comfortable. You're comfortable with yourself and you're also comfortable when you meet everybody. Because you know, you're not smelling, but you're smelling nice. Good. Comfort. Now just think about that spiritually. Spiritually, you and I have been washed. All the dirt of sin and whatever, it's all gone, washed, gone been washed by the blood of Jesus. Washed. So now you behave like somebody who's washed. Now don't behave like, God, I'm still dirty. All right? 
I just washed you with the blood of Jesus. Why are you saying you are dirty? Lord, I thank you for the blood of Jesus. I've been washed by the blood. So washed. Then you have been sanctified. God has made you holy. Now, if you think about it, the Holy One, God is perfectly holy. The Holy One has made you and me, made us holy, set us apart for Himself. He didn't make us 50% holy. I'll make you 50% holy, 50% you keep some sin. No, He didn't do that. He made you holy. Who? The Holy One. Made you holy for himself in Jesus Christ. Now that's who you are. That's who I am. I have to embrace that. Lord, thank you that you have sanctified me. You set me apart. And when we start thinking like that, then when we live on earth, temptation will come. The devil will come knocking on the door. Hello, I have some temptation for you. Something you want to do, take. I am sanctified. Wrong address. Devil, not this address. Go somewhere. This address, there's a person here who is sanctified. I have nothing to do with this. No interest. Please go. Because I am sanctified. The holy God has made you, has made me holy for himself. So that's how we have to think. If we don't think like that, and we think 50-50, then 50% of us will say, Ah, uh -huh, devil, come, come, come. What? You have any other better temptation? <laughs> Give me two. I'll take combo. <laughs> No, no, no. Don't think of yourself 50-50. You are 100% sanctified. The Holy God has made you holy for Himself. That's how you have to think. I am sanctified unto God. He has made me holy in Jesus Christ. I have nothing to do with all those old way of life. Okay? So, embracing this truth is going to help us live holy. Uh, lesson number 36 is a repeat. We are saints in Christ. You are a saint. You are a holy person. The word uh, saint, a holy one. You are a holy person in Christ. Lesson 36, page 50. Right, And we see that when Paul was writing to believers in different churches, like we see uh, at Corinth, to the Rome, believers in Rome, believers in Ephesus, believers in Philippi, believers in Colossae. To all of them, he calls them as saints. Saints means holy ones, sanctified ones. Now, we know nobody's perfect. We know that as people, I'm sure in all of these churches, there will be some problem, something going on, going on. We know that. But why is Paul still calling all of them as saints? Why is he still addressing them as holy ones? Because that is who they are in. That is who they are. But you will see that in all of these episodes, he is still teaching them how to live holy. He's still teaching them. You know, you have to do like this, don't do like this, be like this. He's still teaching them. But the way he looks at them, the way he addresses them is, you are holy ones. Now you have to learn how to live holy. 
to teach you. I have to correct you. I have to tell you what's right and wrong. I have to, we have to do that. But in Christ, you are a holy person. And therefore, you have the capacity to live like a holy person. You have the capacity to live a holy life because you are a holy person in Christ. Now, lesson 37. Believers are a holy temple in the Lord. Believers are a holy temple. And you find this in many of Paul's writings. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 21 and 22, page 51. Ephesians 2, 21, 22. In whom, that is in Christ, the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. So we, in Christ, in the Lord, we are a holy temple. Holy temple. Verse 22, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. So in these two verses, three times he's saying, in whom, in the Lord. Verse 22, in whom. So he's talking about being in Christ, our life in Christ, and as believers, as all of us are in Christ, we are a holy temple. And what is this holy temple? It's the dwelling place of God. It's a temple, it's the dwelling place of God. So spiritually, he's saying, in Christ, we are the temple. We are the dwelling place of God. So when you think about yourself, think about yourself like that. I am the dwelling place of God. I'm a temple of God. You're a temple of God. All right, so let's say this together. In Christ, I am a temple of God. I'm the dwelling place of God. All right, so... When you think about yourself, think like that. I am a temple of God. I am a dwelling place of God. So then, in the temple, you want to keep it clean. Because it is God's dwelling place. So you think, do I want this in here? No, no, no. This is God's house. It's God's dwelling place. I, I don't want this here. I don't want this evil here. I don't want this sin here. I don't want this evil thing here. So that's the process of sanctification. We also know 1 Corinthians 16 and 17. This is page 52. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. So the temple of God is holy. So, I'd like us to memorize 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. Okay, so please make a note of that. Try and memorize that also. Add it to the list. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. The temple of God is holy, which temple you are. So please memorize those two scriptures. Lesson 38. So here's the interesting part. Somebody will say, "Ah, oh, if you say we are all sanctified already, why is it we still sin? Why is it we are still, you know, not behaving properly, this, that? You know, why is it? So it doesn't match. If you say we are already sanctified in Christ, we are already holy, then look at our lives. Why is it like this? So that's why we need to understand 
the two sides, the duality of this. That means in Christ the work is complete. And in our daily life, we are learning how to live from that completed work. So there is a process involved in daily life. We are not yet perfect. The, the work that Jesus did on the cross is perfect. And in Christ, he has made us perfect. But in everyday life, we are being made perfect. So look at this. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews 10. We're going to look at four verses here. Hebrews 10. Verse 9. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. That means he took away the first, the old covenant. He brought in the new. Verse 10. By that will, that is by this new covenant, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Notice in verse 14, it's past tense. It's already done. By this will, by that will, or by the new covenant, which he has brought in, in the new covenant, we have been sanctified. It's done. Past tense. We have been sanctified. How? Through the body of Jesus. That means through his sacrifice on the cross. The work is done. But then look at verse 14. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. So now he's saying we are being sanctified. Verse 10, we have been sanctified. Work is done. Verse 14, we are being Sanctified. Work is happening. So you underline the two. We have been sanctified. Work is done. Verse 14. We are being sanctified. Work is still happening. So both are true in the life of the believer. We have been sanctified in Christ. God has said, I set you apart. In our everyday life, we are being sanctified. Work is going on. Work is going on. Slowly, slowly, he is sanctifying us. Yeah. But if someone is uh, like having normal life, not in ministry, not have this much knowledge, he is in secular world. He's in secular world, or he or she, they are in secular world, and uh, they are Christian, they are believers, they are also sanctified, but they are committing sins. Sins like normal, going out at night, having parties, things like that. So, uh, what does it mean? Like, all right, see, are like the kingdom of God is for them or not? Okay. So, the question which is more important? The work that Jesus did is the most important because without that, this won't happen, right? That means the fact that we have been sanctified in Christ, that's our anchor, right? For all believers, whether you are, you know, you're in ministry or whether you're, you know, you're engaging in, like you're saying, in the world, in the secular world, whatever. For all believers, it's the same thing. It's the work that Jesus did for us on the cross. The fact that we have been saying that's most important. Without that, the other thing won't happen. Right? Now, for all believers, we need to come to understand this truth. Only then we can actually start living the sanctified life. That means live out uh, being sanctified right 
So that's why we need to preach and teach the truth. We need to uh, give the God's word to believers. Help them understand this is what God has done for you in Christ. And then slowly the transformation will happen. As they are renewed in their mind, then we, all of us, whether we are here in Bible college, we're outside, we're all the same. As we are renewed in our mind, then we will be transformed in our behavior, in the way we live. Right? So, let's say there's a person who becomes a believer. Uh, he receives Jesus. Now, at that moment, when he truly believes in Jesus and he receives Jesus, he is sanctified. That work is true for him. But in his day-to-day -day life, he may still, you know, be doing certain wrong things. So how, how do we help them? Just like what Paul was doing to the churches that he planted. He was teaching them the word of God. He was teaching them the truth. And then as they embrace the truth, what will happen? Their life will be changed. They will come out. Now, if you don't give them the words, if you don't give them the truth, and we just say, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that. They don't have the strength. They don't have the empowering to overcome those things. So, uh, that will not help them. Just putting rules and regulations will not help them. They need to know the truth of God's word. It's because of the word of God and then they will overcome. Then their life will be changed. So what Jesus has done for us, that's the most important thing. Then we must come to understand that, then our life will be changed. If some old people, okay. They still smoke, smell, drink, everything, okay. Okay. Because of their past. Okay, so they've been doing these things for a long time. Okay, so the question is, if a believer smokes, will he go to heaven? One, he'll go to heaven very soon. <laughs> because instead of living long, he'll die early. <laughs> So you'll have a very fast ticket to heaven. <laughs> uh, see, I see if a believer is struggling with sin, right? Like smoking, drinking, some habits. We know it's wrong. So I'm not saying it's not wrong. It is wrong to destroy your own body. We just read. Your body is a temple, so you're drinking, you're smoking, or doing other things that are destroying the body. Yeah, so you'll go to heaven very soon. But the question is, will he go to heaven? Or will smoking, drinking, keep him out of heaven? Right? I don't, say, I don't want us to put one answer for every person, because we don't know where that person is spiritually. Maybe that person is seeking God and saying, God, help me come out of this. And he's in the process, but he hasn't overcome yet. Or maybe there's another person who doesn't care. I don't care what I do. I just. So there could be different, you know, places where they are in their relationship with God. So I don't want us to judge them. Yes, we will tell them what you're doing is wrong. And if you continue in sin, Bible says these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Bible says that I'm not your judge, God is the judge. But we can only say what the Bible says. See, the Bible is very clear on these things. Those who commit these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So we can warn them, we can help them by teaching them God's truths. 
Pray with them. Pray for their deliverance. But we don't want to sit as a judge. That let God do. Yeah. Because what if that person is sincerely trying? Say, yes, God, I want to be free. I want to come out of this. And they are sincerely taking a hold of the truth of God's word and seeking God. So they are in that journey. That's not the time to discourage them. That's the time to encourage and say, hey, keep going. Yeah, so we don't want to the judge and say, hey, yesterday you smoked one cigarette, half a cigarette, you're going to hell. <laughs> that is not the time for us to speak like that, right? We don't know his situation. Maybe he was smoking 20 cigarettes. Now he's come to half a cigarette. For him, it's a great progress. For us, we're saying he half a cigarette. <laughs> I don't know. So let us not be judges. Let us only help people, encourage them. Tell them the truth. Of course, we have to tell them what is right, what is wrong. We're not compromising on that. Um, once a believer uh, sanctified yes. and baptized by the Holy Spirit, is it possible for the evil spirit to attack him or touch him or dwells in him? Right. So, the answer is yes. So, can a believer, right? Okay, he's born again, he's living a good life, he's baptized in the Holy Spirit, anointed by God, etc., ministering. Can the enemy attack him? Yeah. Right? But, the Bible tells us, to guard ourselves. The Bible has given us what we need to protect ourselves. Right? So, for example, Ephesians chapter 6, Paul says, you know, uh, verse 10 to 18, he says, you know, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. You know, put on the full armor of God. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness. So we are fighting against these spirits of wickedness. And so he says, you know, you put on the full armor. He tells us each piece of the armor, the helmet of salvation, all of that. And he says, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the evil one. You know, that means the devil will keep fighting fire, those fiery darts. But we have to quench. We have to use our shield of faith. Stand God. And he says, having done all to stand, you can stand. In the evil day. That means there will be these, these evil days. The times when the attack is very intense. But if you have the armor on, you will stand. So he didn't say the attacks will not come. But he said if you have the armor on, you will stand. Okay? And First John 5, uh, First John 5, 18, I think. 18, 19, yes, 18 and 19. First John 5. It says, and we know that the whole world lies under the lap. Of the wicked one. And we who are born of God. He was born of God. He keeps himself. And that wicked one cannot touch him. Right. So that means. The whole world. Is under the influence of the wicked one. Devil is working everywhere. But for those of us who are born of God. No, First John 5. 18, 19. For those of us who are born of God. We keep ourselves, we guard ourselves, and that wicked one cannot touch us. So the devil will attempt, but he cannot succeed. Right? But here's the thing. So God, so the answer to your question is: God has given us weapons to protect ourselves, He's given us our armor. The devil will attack us, but if we stand guard, he, the devil will not succeed. But if the believer is not careful, then we can open the door to the enemy. That's why in Ephesians 4, 27, Paul says, Do not give any place to the devil. He's writing to believers. Don't give any place to the so what will give place to the devil? Sin, strife, 
jealousy, anger, bitterness, all these things will open the door. In James chapter 3, uh, let, just look at this. This is very serious. Uh, Ephesians 4, 27. Ephesians 4, verse 27. Now give place to the devil. It's telling the believer, don't give any place. Don't give any foothold. Don't give any room to the devil. So James chapter 3, I just want us to show this. See this here. You see, when we get into strife and jealousy, we actually open the door to the devil. Hebrews, James. James chapter 3. Okay. Look at verse 16. James 3, 16. Are we all there? Okay, look at that. What James says. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. So, where there is envy, that is jealousy, and self-seeking, that means uh, selfish ambition, selfish desire, selfish promotion. Where, je where there is jealousy, where there is self, what happens? It is like you're opening doors, windows, everything. You're saying, devil, please come. That's what he's saying. Because where there is envy and self-seeking, there is confusion and every evil thing. Every evil thing comes in. So imagine a believer. He's good. He loves Jesus. Full of the Holy Spirit. Anointed. Praying in tongues. Doing ministry. Everything. But he has jealousy in his heart. And selfish. Self-seeking. I want to promote myself. I want to become Buddha person. You know. Famous. Self. Where there is jealousy, where there is self-seeking, what happens? Confusion and every evil thing come. So what will happen? You will see in their ministry, in their life, all confusion. All kinds of things. Huh? What is the problem? So God, he's anointed man. Such this. What is the problem? Why? You don't know his heart. Inside there is? Jealousy. Inside there is self-seeking. The Bible says where there is jealousy and where there is self-seeking, confusion comes. And every evil thing comes. So, that's why I said, I answered your question as yes, the devil can come. Because these kinds of things, jealousy, self-seeking, will open the door to the devil. He comes in. That is why we have to keep these things out of our life. So even in churches, the church will be wonderful, blessed by God, anointed, wonderful, nice ministry is happening. But suddenly, maybe between two people, there is jealousy. That's all it takes, only two people. Jealousy happening. One person jealous of the other. Other person jealous of this person. That's all. Door is open. Confusion comes. Every evil thing starts coming. Say, God, such a beautiful church, wonderful ministry, a great anointing. But why is this happening? Jealous. Or self-seeking. Selfish interest. Opens the door. Right? So, in addition to being anointed and called by God, we have to guard against all these things. Okay? Yeah. All right. 
Any other question? All right. Okay, let's pause here. We'll go for our break. We'll come back and we will go forward from here. I will come back at 11 o'clock. Okay? Thank you.